In the last couple of talks, I've given an overview of the Army Mount Warfare School, or AMWS, and the Marine Corps Mountain Warfare Training Center, MWTC. I want to talk more about the specialty courses that AMWS teaches, which are the Rough Terrain Evacuation course, Mountain Planners course, and the Mountain Rifleman's course. I reached out to a page called Armchair Sniper that I've seen post a lot about the Army sniper community and individual sniper training. Turns out he's actually been to the Mount Rifleman's course taught by MWS. And I've been following him on social media, so as someone that's been so embedded in the sniper community such as himself, I want to get his thoughts on the course, talk to him about long-range shooting in general, and get his thoughts on the direction of the military sniper programs. So I'm here with David from Arch Armchair Sniper. So if you give a brief description of your military and shooting background. Uh, yeah, I've uh, been in the military since 2010, and uh, I've been a military sniper since August of 2012. I've spent uh, the entirety of my military career, except for those two years, in some sort, form or fashion of reconnaissance, whether it be sniper or on the recon side. I've held the position of sniper, spotter, sniper section leader. I've also instructed United States Army Sniper Course. I was the primary instructor for mission planning, range estimation, uh, to note a few. And now uh, I'm the competitions coach for 10th Mountain Division, where we just competed in the International Sniper Competition and the Best Ranger Competition. Okay, so we were talking a little bit about how you've been through some of the Army Mount Warfare's courses in Jericho. And I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the Mountain Rifleman's course. Uh, so would you say that Mountain Infantry and Snipers go hand in hand? I'm one of those guys that say everything and Sniper go hand in hand. You have to be good at everything. <laughs> um, but absolutely, I, I think operating in the mountains is one of the hardest things we can do. So if snipers are better at it than the average person, we can easily outmaneuver many of the adversaries we'll come across. Nice. The key thing to teach is mobility. And I feel like mobility, especially in the reconnaissance world, is right one of the tenets is maintaining the freedom of maneuver. Yeah. In, in layman's terms, I always just say uh, mobility is survivability. We can't be pinned down or, and we can't put ourselves into a corner. And mountains specifically are one of those places where you can quickly put yourself into a corner if you don't know how to maneuver through them. All right. You know, when you're working in that sort of genre of infantry, you know, you don't have that many resources with you, right? In a, in a scout platoon, you have maybe one or two machine guns versus an infantry platoon where you have six or eight machine guns. Uh, so you're pretty limited in your ability to fight. Absolutely. Uh, which does make it easier for us. We're not carrying around medium machine guns everywhere. But on the contrary, if, if something happens, we're also not carrying around medium machine guns. Okay, so you said you went to Mountain Rifleman's course in 2015. Uh, what were valuable takeaways you took from that course, and what from that course have you used since? Uh, I can't use names because I honestly don't remember a single one of the instructor's names. Uh, but the first day I was there, I think we had like a February or March class, and it's relatively cold in Vermont. And you see a bunch of these guys just shivering and generally being uncomfortable. And the first thing that this, this instructor said to us is, being uncomfortable is okay. You should be uncomfortable right now, but you shouldn't be cold. And that's always stuck with me. I, as, funny, as funny as that is, as that sounds, like it really resonated with me being in 10th Mountain because you're uncomfortable a lot. I, you're always operating in an environment where it's 40 to negative 20. You shouldn't go around uh, freezing your ass off, uh, pardon my French, but you need to you need to get used to being a little chilly. Uh, we're not saying you need to lose dexterity in your fingers or start getting frostbite, but you're not always going to be warm and toasty. And if you are, you're actually wasting a lot of energy 
um, and sweating, and water is also an incredibly precious resource while moving through the mountains. <laughs> that's not really what you were going for, I know, but that's one of those things that absolutely stuck with me. But on the more technical side, just learning systems and how to get my rifle up and down the mountains was fantastic. Just learning uh, how to like an, observe a bombproof tree, tie off to it to make sure that uh, I can drop a line to the guy below me and use it a uh, like a system just to bring up our 50 cal or whatever which is, it's not a light r rifle at all. It's minimum 28 pounds, you know? Um, and nobody wants to just carry it up the mountain as is, so it's usually in a pelican case, and we're kind of dragging it up the side. Um, and then the angle shooting and understanding the winds that you'll be operating in when you are above 3,000 foot of elevation. That's uh, all a lot of the... I'll say the the cliff notes of what I learned in that course. Right. So there seems to be a big shift towards designated marksmen now in the Army, especially with the rollout of the M110A1. Looks like every infantry squad is going to be assigned at least one M110A1, which is a 308 rifle. Can you explain the difference between a designated marksman and a sniper? Uh, yeah. In... Looking at it kind of objectively, a sniper and a DMR, they do share a lot of similarities. But the point of a DMR is for rapid target interdiction, not necessarily from a concealed position. They also care less about shot placement um, in relation to the, the human that they are shooting at. They really just care about the effects of the round. They... Uh, they're tr the DMR is really trying to bridge that gap between the standard rifleman and your saw or your squad automatic weapon. They're, they're really trying to bridge that gap between the 300 and that 600. They need precise fires, but they don't necessarily need to take those precise fires from a concealed location. They just need to be able to engage those targets very, very rapidly, um, like I said before. Designated marksmen in general are inherently less precise. The standard designated marksman rifle is going to be about a 2 MOA or 2 minute of angle rifle, where your standard precision rifle that a sniper would typically use is about half that, sitting right about 1 MOA uh, at their dispersion rate. DMRs also don't technically care about observation or reporting. They really only care about shooting the weapon and shooting the weapon in alternate positions where a sniper needs to sit and stare and determine who is the appropriate person to shoot a dmr is going to be honestly they they care less about who they are shooting specifically and just making sure that their shots are accurate does that answer your question that does that does so I know it was all the buzz maybe a couple months ago, but the Marine Corps is getting rid of the sniper aspect of their scout sniper platoons. Now those platoons are only scouts. Uh, you know, in the Army, in our infantry battalion scout platoon, there are both scouts and snipers. Uh, why is it important for infantry battalions, in your opinion, to not just have scouts, but also snipers available organically. Wow. Uh, as much as I'd like to say I prepared for this question, I uh, I don't think I, I don't think there is a a great answer. There's a, a lot of political <laughs> answers out there. Uh, all right. So looking at what the Marines did, and uh, do I think the Army should copy them? I would say no. The Marines realigned their force with a specific mindset. The Marines are now going back to being a force that is supposed to take islands quickly, and snipers are no longer required to take islands quickly. Uh, we have artillery for that. We have 
huge raid forces, and that's kind of how the Marines are moving. They, that's kind of the direction that they're reconsolidating into. Where the army, we have a lot of a lot of necessity to be able to manipulate the battlefield. And one of the best ways to manipulate the battlefield is through the use of these low-cost enablers. Low-cost enablers are going to be your small UASs, your snipers, uh, a lot of your electronic warfare specialists, and your, your Ford observers. And having snipers within the reconnaissance platoon really does allow a battalion commander the ability to create corridors where an enemy is not really going to want to move because of the fact that we can observe fires, we can lock down entire grid squares with three guys, especially if you're really good at your job and you know exactly where you should place in order to prevent them from moving. Um, the Marines don't necessarily have that requirement because they already know that they're going to be a raid force. They're going to be a shock force. They're going to be the first ones there. They are going to be uh, more susceptible to sniper fire because of the way they, they are realigning their force, but also because of what their job is. Now, on the Army side, our job is to hold the ground and to outmaneuver the opponents. We don't necessarily, especially dismounted infantry platoons, don't have to take ground. That's not really our job. It's mostly to hold ground. And you hold ground really well with observers, those sensors. And snipers are still, to this day, one of the best sensors on the battlefield because we have the human component. We're not just in the sky. We can see line of sight to wherever you need us to see. We have the ability to use our head to outthink the, the adversaries. We have the ability to engage the adversary or specifically the adversary necessary in order to uh, change the side of battle. I'm not, a sniper is not going to use his, one of his 60 rounds on random private if he doesn't need to. He's going to wait and look for that shiny thing on somebody's lapel, you know what I mean? Um, but I think I'll digress a little bit and, and just say it might be time for the sniper community to look at themselves and say, like, hey, is this is this something worth fighting for? Because if it's happening in the Marines then obviously the army is looking at cutting costs and uh, turning things over when they can. But on the flip, flip side of that, the army also just spent several hundred million dollars creating a new sniper rifle for force comm and SOCOM units to use. So obviously there is a thirst for us, at least until the sustainment of the new Mark 22 that just got fielded comes into term yeah thanks that was that was a a good answer to it you know coming from a infantry battalion scout platoon where we had a section of snipers as part of the platoon i could say that you know we we did do a lot of observation trainings and, and things like that where you have that standoff and that could fall within that three to six hundred meter range where a typical infantryman, even if they're a scout, might not be comfortable with making that type of shot. And, you know, the snipers that I've worked with seem to absolutely be comfortable taking those those types of shots. So if we were saying that we, let's now divest scouts and snipers, I think that they go hand in hand. Yeah, I... You're, I think we are all on the right track there. Uh, the one thing that we do have to get, uh, I think, pay a little bit closer attention to is what snipers want their job to be. Because like what you just described, we could have one or two 
actual snipers in a infantry company and be just as effective. Um, and that's a lot of what we did in World War One and World War Two. But then coming to like the Vietnam and the Korean era, we decided we wanted assets that were just good at reconnaissance in general. And that's kind of where the modern day interpretation of a sniper comes in. Because what you just described is the World War One and World War Two definition of a sniper, essentially. It's just a, a guy that's really comfortable shooting really accurately, embedded in a company to hedge those gaps. Right. We'll get down to the big question here. And I know it's loaded, but what would you like to see more of in the future from the sniper community? Would you want to see more social media, more people taking civilian courses, maybe an expanded, you know, military program for snipers? Uh, what do you think? Oh, you weren't kidding. As that is indeed a loaded question, but I I relish this question because this is where we put the responsibility back on ourselves. Um, as fantastic as civilian courses are and as fa- as fantastic as all the, the new hotness is, the new equipment, all this new fielding, it really does not detract from what our job is. Um, I really would like to see snipers getting out there and actually cracking a book. <laughs> is, uh, is I, t- I talk to snipers on a daily basis and a lot of them have that bravado that you talked about. And unfortunately, many of them are what we call Hollywood snipers. They want to do all the cool stuff. They want to look good until it's time to actually do the stuff that becomes, is becoming of a sniper. Uh, they don't, they don't have the intestinal fortitude to stay up for 24 hours and observe a target, or again, they don't have the intestinal fortitude to open a book and realize that they don't know everything. Uh, what I would like to see from the sniper community is just a lot of reflection on their current capabilities and then a pivot from that reflection making us like the most lethal people on the battlefield like we used to be it doesn't necessarily mean more social media i actually i think the social media side of it is awesome we have uh about five or six personalities out there right now that really have changed the sniper's mentality in the past year Uh, i'd like to think of myself as one but then there's chris rance and then live from good luck road and all of the sniper battalion or sniper brigade instagram pages talking about like how they're training together and working together that's what we need is we need to get away from everyone's an island and start working together as a community once more Absolutely. Yeah, everyone you mentioned are people that I have followed for the last year or two. And, you know, it gets me more interested in learning more about long range shooting and and precision rifle and things like that. So I appreciate you guys, you know, putting that information out there. And if it's sparking my interest, I know it's sparking a lot of other people's interests. Heck, and maybe we can even turn this into a recruiting tool, you know? Snipers can be uh, the poster <laughs> boys of the army once again. All right. Well, that's all the that's all the questions I or all the things that I wanted to touch on. Is there anything that you want to touch on, or or uh, you know anything coming up for your page, or, or anything like that that you want to talk about? Oh, if people are listening to this, I really do appreciate you guys being patient with me. I uh, I have so much on my plate right now, and uh, I definitely bit off more than I can chew in terms of all of my current projects but uh, I'm currently working with a publisher on getting like the little book of marksmanship up and off the ground so I would say in the next like six to eight months look out for that. So originally I thought this conversation was going to go in the direction of specific training ideas and long-range shooting techniques 
but it actually turned into a conversation about specialty jobs within the military. I think there's a couple common threads between mountaineers and snipers. Firstly, we need to sell our capabilities because it's unlikely that who's ever in charge of the big picture came from our niche communities. So they might not fully understand what benefits we can provide that big picture. Secondly, we have to actually be able to do the things that we say we can do. Because if we get tasked to do something that we just said we can do and we don't deliver, that destroys our credibility and it might be a while before we can build that back up again. A lot of times people in charge ask for a capabilities brief from sections that they don't know much about. The section leader could put together a PowerPoint, maybe that's all they have time for, but you could also do a demonstration that could more effectively get your point across. For a sniper section, maybe that's going to a range day, or maybe that leader can observe a stock. For mountaineers, maybe that's showing a squad moving through a VDA. It would both explain your capabilities and demonstrate that you actually can do what you say you can do. That's all I got. Let me know what you guys think about the sniper community as a whole and if we were wrong or spot on with what we said.